Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. So our OP cut down his tree on his property, and the neighbor wants him to pay? His reaction makes more sense if the neighbor mistakenly thought that the tree was his. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here, and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. It was my dang tree that was diseased and my neighbor wants me to pay him? On Monday, I cut down an apple tree that's been on property I own since the 1950s. The apple tree sat five feet from my property line on either side, but it did hang over onto my neighbor's property. On Friday, my neighbor behind me came out yelling and complaining that I've ruined his home property value by cutting down the tree. He also demanded that I pay him for cutting down the tree because apparently the tree was one of the reasons he bought his house. He also said that he'll be missing out on the fruit now that it's gone. I figured I could ignore him, but tonight I came home to a letter demanding that I compensate my neighbor for the tree. Edit. I went over this morning and spoke with my neighbor's wife. She was a bit nicer than her husband. I explained to her that the tree was diseased and needed to come down, but that I had plans to plant a new apple tree and possibly a peach tree as well. I also notified her that the other tree on my property, very large red cedar tree, will be cut down early in January. She said her husband will probably be upset by this as well, but she understands the tree is a danger to my home. And our second story. Your son is mine now. So one day, me and my mother were shopping, and EM tells my mother, Wow, that's a cute kid you got there. Overheard it and said, Thank you, with a smile. EM smiles back at me and says, Want to be my son? I go over to my mother and just stand by her really close without telling her what EM said. We walk away and go check out the shoe section, and then EM follows us. At this point, I knew it wasn't safe to be around her. I tell my mom that the EM is still watching us and my mother decides we should just go home. I tell my mother that I want to go to the electronic section and check out some things, since phones were kind of new to me, and so I have a little fun listening to music on the headphones and stuff while the EM is just looking at me. Now I start thinking, okay, this stupid bee better get the hell away before I get security. I ask EM if something's wrong and she says, be my son, I'll treat you really good. And so, with the mindset of an eight-year-old, I was freaked out. I ran over to my mom and told her what was up. She got security and told them, this woman is trying to take my son, which they believe since she was kind of sketchy. When we were talking to the security, EM was just spying on us and ran up to us and said, I didn't do anything, and give me my son back. My mother steps in and says, back off from my son, you freak, and me and my mom just walk out. We paid, of course. And I think she got a punishment for trying to attempt a damn kidnapping. So lesson learned to her, don't mess with kids. I was 13 and looking back at it, I wish I actually punched her. But I wouldn't risk getting charges. And our next story. No show to a corporate meeting? We'll see about that. The cast. Brooke, my sister. Angie, accounting girl. Mark, milk toast boss, Victor, vice president of operations. This story is about my sister's first job after graduating from college with a bachelor's degree in business management back in the middle 70s. She was hired by that recording tape company whose advertising tagline was, is it real or is it? Anyway, her job was the travel coordinator for both the sales and tech support teams out in the field to come to the corporate offices periodically for various types of meetings or training, depending on the field employee's specialty. Brooke's responsibilities included booking airline flights, hotels, rental cars, approving per diems, and other travel-related upfront arrangements. It didn't take her long to figure out that there were a lot of no-shows, particularly from the sales staff, who always seemed to have some valid excuse not to make it to the meeting, and often with last-minute cancellations. You know, the I've just booked this golf game with my most important client this week, so can you reschedule me type of reasons? Seeing how these cancellations were costing the company big bucks, Brooke hatched a plan that created class rosters for each class and would, just like a teacher, make notes as to who showed up and who didn't. After the class was over, she would calculate how much those who didn't show up had cost the company in terms of cancellation fees, missed flights, etc., and present them to Mark. His reaction? 
typical of a middle manager protecting his little fiefdom, would take her report, tell her, I'll look into it, throw it into his box, and then promptly forget about it. My sister has a tremendous amount of patience, unless you're being stupid, which, in this case, Mark was, as far as she was concerned. Fast forward a couple of months, the reports are still stacked on top of each other in Mark's inbox, and Brooke's getting real frustrated because these field guys are abusing the time and effort she's putting in while attempting to get them in for their required classes. So one day, Brooke's having lunch in the company cafeteria along with a gal from corporate accounting. They get to talking, and Angie mentions that she's noticed the travel department's expenses are really high, percentage-wise, compared to others, and asks if Brooke has any idea why. Well, that was all it took. My sister unloaded her frustration with all the cancellations with no repercussions, thus sending the travel department's budgets off the charts, not to mention the fact she wasn't getting any support from Mark towards reducing the numbers. Brooke tells Angie she's got an idea to put an end to the waste, but she wants to get approval from somebody higher up the food chain in order to implement her idea because she doubts Mark's ability to comprehend, let alone implement. Angie tells Brooke that she thinks she knows exactly who Brooke needs to talk to, and within a couple of days, Brooke and Angie are sitting in a plush corner office talking to the vice president of operations, Victor, explaining the situation. It only took Victor a couple of minutes to make a decision after Brooke described what was going on, plus her idea on how to correct it, and he told Angie that Brooke's idea was brilliant and that the policy change would become effective on the first of the month, 10 days later, which he followed up with a memorandum sent to all employees shortly after their meeting was over. Paydays were the 5th and the 20th. Those in the field who had expense accounts had to complete and turn them into accounting by the 5th to be processed and paid along with regular wages, bonuses, and commissions on the 20th. Brooks' policy change idea with the victor's blessing was to charge back against the offender's expense account the cost associated with getting him to his corporate meeting when he didn't show up, airline fares, hotel rooms, rental cars, etc. Sis told me that the first month the policy went into effect, the howls of protest could be heard all over Silicon Valley as several ended up with minuscule paychecks after the chargebacks. But the policy had exactly the results Brooke wanted. Within three months, everyone showed up to their meetings on time as scheduled and virtually without any more no-shows. Epilogue. Some adjustments were made to the policy during Sis's tenure, one of them being that if you knew in advance that you couldn't make a scheduled meeting, as long as it was a minimum of two weeks' notice, she could then reschedule without penalties. Other situations, such as medical emergencies, were judged on a case-by-case -case basis, but required documentation to prevent the chargeback. Sis only worked at this company about 18 months before a headhunter stole her away to be the plant manager's administrative assistant when the microchip manufacturer that's in practically everyone's personal computer decided to build a new facility outside of Silicon Valley. She told her new boss she wasn't moving unless he could find her husband a job within the company, and he did, so they did, and they've been in that area ever since. My sister's had a great career, and I'm very proud of her. And our last story. I want walls and a large gate to guard my house. I grew up in Malaysia for 19 years, and in Malaysia, almost every landed house has walls between houses and a gate where all or most of the cars will be parked inside. I love the security, and especially in Malaysia, it's normal for people to live in a guarded residential area, meaning all houses of a certain area are guarded by a larger fence slash wall, and you would have guards guarding the entrance to that residential area. So the security is top notch there. They even have this in less affluent areas in Malaysia. Anyway, I went to college in the U.S. and married an American and currently am staying here. My husband loved the idea of having a gated house when he visited my family home in Malaysia, and we both wanted our new home in the U.S. to have one too. So we designed our new home that way. We have a large yard with a pool and a porch to keep all our cars under with the added large automatic gate guarding the entrance. Our walls between our neighbors, we've got a corner lot, so only one adjacent neighbor are pretty high, goes up to almost the second floor as we love our privacy. Keep in mind we were in no way blocking the sunlight coming through to the other side of our neighbor's house because their house was a bit far from the wall. So around a week after we settled in, neighbors were vacationing so they weren't there when we moved in, the neighbors rang the bell next to the gate and greeted us nicely. 
I politely asked them to join us on the veranda, not keen on having other people inside the house during COVID, and the furniture outside is easier to sanitize, for some drinks to get to know each other. They started off friendly until Laura started saying why the walls and the scary looking gate. We answered, oh, we like our privacy and the extra security. Oh, and don't worry, we had our people check out that we didn't touch your property when they were putting in those walls. They seemed very ticked off and said that they wanted this neighborhood to be an open area where the kids can ride bikes around everyone's backyard and enjoy the greeneries. We tried to be nice and apologize, but they sort of implied that they were going to report this to the community board. I don't know the correct term for that. And have the walls broken down. My husband and I were taken aback, and I don't respond well to threats. I sternly said that we did not break any laws here. I had it checked, and we will do whatever we want on our land. Laura's husband then raised the fact that because of the gate, our driveway was now inaccessible to other people. He had an agreement with the previous owner that he could park some of his cars there as he couldn't park on the side of the road. It's a two-way road. We nicely apologized, but said that obviously that would not sit well with us as the gate will always be closed unless our cars are entering or leaving. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.